Hello everyone and welcome to Arcade Viking. Today is my second video for Black History Month as well as Indigenous History. Uh, the video is the Second Seminole War, um, Seminoles and Runaway Slaves during Indian Removal. This is a very important subject because this is one of the longest wars fought uh, in U.S. history against uh, American Indians. Um, it ran uh, about seven years with uh, only wars such as uh, the Chickamauga Cherokee War running slightly longer. Uh, what also makes it important for Black History Month is large populations of free black communities as well as um, enslaved Africans who were rebelling against their uh, masters, uh, the plantation owners, uh, participated in this war on the side of the Seminoles. So that's why I'm bringing this video to you today is it is a subject that is not talked about often outside of Florida, South Georgia, and uh, Southern Alabama. So who are the Seminoles? Well, the Seminoles are a kind of um, offshoot of the Creek Confederacy, in which uh, large populations of the Creek Confederacy fled to Florida, where they intermarried with the native Floridian uh, tribes, as well as free black communities that were already present within Florida, um, and combining the various cultural aspects of these uh, ethnic groups uh, into a new, unique indigenous culture. Uh, one of the thing, one of the aspects uh, that we can see in this combination of this new culture are villages like this in which the um, free uh, black communities and the Creek uh, citizens who came into Florida adopted the building styles of the native uh, indigenous peoples of Florida. Uh, which you can see in this picture here, where many houses uh, are on sort of stilts or poles uh, in the swamp, um, which is a building practice that is uh, common throughout many uh, swampy uh, regions, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S. But, you know, how did they get here? How did the creek uh, get from point A, the creek Bersey, to point B, Florida, um, where they intermarried with these cultures. Well, it all goes back to the War of 1812, where the U.S. Uh, waged war against Britain for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons that was uh, brought up by the U.S. Uh, was that U.S. Uh, sailors are being press ganged into working in the British Navy. Um, and while that certainly did happen, um, America had been wanting to go to war with Britain for a long time. Uh, this is where we get the term Warhawk from for the very militaristic uh, individuals within the US Senate um, and has the representatives who wanted to go to war with Britain. So they were gonna find a way to go to war one way or another. Uh, but needless to say, uh, during this time, uh, the Shawnee chief Tecumseh rallied many American Indian tribes under his banner to create a great confederacy in the hopes of driving the U.S. out of their homelands um, and therefore siding with the British because the British were the uh, lesser of two evils because, uh, as I mentioned in my video about the Anglo-Cherokee War, they... Uh, the British at least tried to uh, stop or mitigate, uh, sorry, hinder, uh, stop or hinder um, colon colonial and um, eventual American settlement into uh, Indian territory. Didn't really work, and whether or not the British would have kept up this policy or, um, you know, continuously uh, as hard to determine and probably wouldn't have happened but at least that attempt was there and that's what led to many tribes under Tecumseh including uh, the Creek Confederacy to side with the British. 
So what happened was a civil war within the Creek Confederacy began, in which one side, known as the Red Sticks, uh, joined Tecumseh's Confederacy and the British, while the other side, known as the White Sticks, joined the Cherokee Nation and uh, the U.S. government uh, during the war, which resulted in the uh, U.S. Army under Andrew Jackson uh, marching into Creek territory along with Cherokee and White Stick Creek auxiliaries um, and over the course of a year from 1813 to 1814, destroying uh, all the Red Stick Creek strongholds, culminating in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. So with this defeat of the Red Stick Creek faction of the Creek Confederacy, hundreds and if not thousands of Creek warriors began to retreat into Florida. Not all of them, but a great uh, many of them retreated into Florida um, and precipitated this uh, intermarrying of uh, cultures. Uh, and they lived there um, for, you know, about uh, three to four years until eventually uh, the new Seminole Confederacy began what was known as the uh, First Seminole War. But before we get into that, uh, let's cover some individuals who were amongst the refugees fleeing to Florida. Uh, on the right, you have one individual uh, known as John Horse, who was a uh, black Seminole who was um, essentially uh, was uh, the a descendant of both uh, Creek and uh, Free Blacks, um, who actually participated in the uh, Creek War as well as the First Seminole War. Um, now, I should state that uh, to any uh, Seminole and uh, African American individuals watching, this image of John Horse, as well as another image of John Horse that I'll show later in the video, uh, is unfortunately very problematic. Um, and I apologize for that. Uh, also, unfortunately, the only images available of John Horse are images like this. So this image and the next image are the two least problematic images I was able to find. Um, so I apologize, but unfortunately, it's the only way I could portray him. Uh, but needless to say, he uh, fled to Florida and, and married into the, some, the indigenous uh, Floridian tribes, much like the Creek, uh, and became what was known as a Black Seminole. Uh, and then to the left, you have an individual who was a child at the time, um, Osceola, uh, who uh, he and his family were uh, part of the Red Sea Creek faction. And after the defeat at Horseshoe Bend, uh, Osceola, who was at the time 10 uh, and his family fled into Florida. So, as I said a couple of minutes ago, eventually this intermarrying uh, led to the First Seminole Confederation, um, as well as the First Seminole War. So, this uh, war uh, started by the Seminoles uh, eventually led to uh, Andrew Jackson and his uh, Cherokee and Creek Auxiliaries and U.S. military again going on the move and invading Florida. And in the course of this war, Jackson won uh, a slew of victories uh, in Florida against the Seminoles uh, in battles such as uh, St. Mark's Battle at March 1818, Sewanee in April 1818, and Pensacola in May 1818, eventually defeating the Seminoles and forcing them uh, to sign a treaty known as the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, which um, forced the Seminole to be uh, cloistered uh, and relegated to this small region of Florida. So uh, with that uh, began a time of relative peace for uh, about 10 to 20 years. Um, and in this time, the Seminole, as well as uh, four other tribes, Became, became known as the five civilized tribes. Of course, civilized is a loaded term. Uh, many of the de things that define civilized to American and European um, minds already existed within these five nations. Uh, but um, regardless of that, 
these five tribes felt that if they adopted European and American uh, culture, and that they would not be removed and exterminated. Of course, we know that that's not the case. It was always about racism, not about how uh, European or American you dressed or anything like that. Um, they were always going to find a reason to try and exterminate or remove these peoples. Uh, but there was no way to completely know that at the time. Um, and one of the aspects of American and European culture that these five tribes adopted was what was known as chattel slavery, or slavery in which you own somebody, specifically uh, enslaved Africans. Now, uh, it should be noted that uh, these five tribes, as well as other tribes, did have a form of enslavement before um, the adoption of chattel slavery, but it was not uh, itself chattel slavery, whereas chattel slavery is owning somebody as if they are property, um, while the original form of enslavement in these five tribes and other surrounding tribes was more of an extension of uh, blood law, in which I or my tribe were to kill an individual's brother or son or what have you, uh, and in retaliation, the tribe in which we killed, whose uh, son we killed, would then raid us in either kill an equal number of individuals that we did or take captive an equal number of individuals that we had killed. Uh, and then they would hold those uh, captured individuals um, as slaves, uh, sort of temporary slaves, until they would be eventually inducted into the tribe um, and be given full rights of the tribe. Uh, and in fact, in many cases, as described, for example, in um, the Journal of Henry Timberlake, many of these uh, enslaved individuals eventually didn't even want to leave because they were treated so well, um, which obviously is in complete contrast to how uh, African slaves were treated. Because um, in fact, according to the, the general consensus back then, uh, was you were considered a bad slave owner if you were too nice to your slaves, which is very unfortunate and led to um, many individuals, including Robert E. Lee, and unfortunately a Cherokee individual named uh, James Mann, as well as his son Joseph Mann, uh, being very brutal to their slaves. Um, uh, and um, unfortunately that was very common uh, in the American South as well as in these five nations. Uh, so, sorry, let me correct myself. Not very common. About 8% of 8% of each of these nations um, own slaves, but that's still common enough. Uh, and it should also be noted that all five of these tribes uh, fully acknowledge their history um, and, a, and consider it a dark spot on their history, but they also teach about it and don't hide, about, hide it. <clears throat> uh, so it was during this time of assimilation um, that uh, many former Creek individuals became, began to become um, very prominent in Seminole uh, politics and Seminole culture. On the right, we have, of course, the uh, aforementioned uh, Os individual Osceola, who was becoming well known for his skill as a warrior uh, and his outspokenness as a politician. Uh, and then to the left, you have the older um, veteran of the Creek War, uh, McCampy. And both of these individuals, as well as other individuals such as Sam Jones, uh, became very influential in uh, Seminole politics. Unfortunately, uh, this prosperity um, began to slowly uh, decline and eventually would <laughs> decline like somebody falling out of a plane uh, with the coming of U.S. officials such as uh, General Clinch on the left uh, and uh, Wiley Thompson, the U.S. Uh, a U.S. Um, Indian agent on the right. Um, and with the coming of individuals such as these two I mentioned came uh, the uh, attempts to pass the Indian Removal Act in all five uh, civilized tribes, as well as other tribes, such as the Seneca and the Second Fox, and etc. 
And as a result of this pushing of the Indian Removal Act, eventually in 1832, uh, the Treaty of Payne's Landing was signed, um, much in a similar way to the Treaty of New Echota uh, and the Cherokee Nation. Um, and also much in a similar way, uh, not all Seminole chiefs were happy to sign this treaty. There were many of them who did and voluntarily went out west, but a great many of them, including Osceola, McCampy, and Sam Jones, um, did not like the signing of this treaty and in, that, and in fact um, saw it as a betrayal by the U.S. government. Because, uh, in fact, they had, uh, at least nominally, tried to work with Indian agents such as Wiley Thompson uh, and the reservation system to mitigate uh, conflict um, and U.S. encroachment. Uh, but, the, of course, this was no longer the case with signing this treaty. Um, and eventually, in 1835, the treaty would be ratified by the U.S. Congress. Uh, and individuals uh, who were um, antagonistic to this treaty, uh, especially Osceola, were arrested uh, for crimes they didn't commit. Um, obviously crimes that Wiley Thompson and other Indian agents sort of um, made up to get rid of these opponents. But it also sort of backfired because uh, Governor Call uh, forced them to <laughs> release these individuals, including Osceola, a few days later. Uh, but by then, the straw had been added to the camel's back and then been broken. And so, as a result of this and the signing of the treaty, uh, many Seminole chiefs, including Osceola, launched a very, very um, organized attack, uh, which you can see here on the map in the right, where they attacked a great many uh, U.S. forts and um, offices of Indian agents and uh, trading posts, etc., uh, one of which was led by Osceola himself on the office of Wiley Thompson, and they promptly killed Wiley Thompson. <clears throat> so as a result of this, uh, I don't want to say uprising, they call it an uprising, of course, that you know would assume that the Seminole Nation was subservient to the U.S. and it wasn't. Uh, so this, as a result of this conflict, uh, the individual on the left, Governor Call, sent in General uh, William Dade uh, into Florida to put the uprising down, um, and this resulted in a very big uh, setback and a very big disaster known as Dade's Massacre, in which Dade and most of his men were slaughtered by the Seminoles under Osceola. So as a result of this setback for the U.S., uh, the war had now begun uh, in full swing, uh, rather than being a quick engagement like the U.S. <laughs> had intended by just simply sending in Dade. Um, and around uh, the start of the war, uh, many black Seminoles uh, began to also join in. Um, on the right is the aforementioned Don Horse. Again, this picture is very problematic. I apologize. Uh, who worked as a warrior uh, and interpreter, as well as the individual on the left, uh, Abraham the Unstoppable, whom I should state uh, in my previous uh, video about Black History Month, the Anglo Cherokee War, I accidentally uh, conflated. Abraham Liam Stoppable with a separate but equally important individual, Abraham the Messenger, uh, who was important for the Anglo Cherokee War. Uh, so I apologize. But uh, either way, uh, Abraham Liam Stoppable, a black Seminole, uh, was a great warrior uh, as well as an interpreter for these Seminole chiefs during this time. Uh, but they didn't just serve as warriors and interpreters, they also went around to uh, various plantations. Uh, and brought as many enslaved Africans uh, on their side. They also went around to free black communities um, and as, in essence started a massive slave uprising uh, in Florida at the same time that this now heavily coordinated uh, attack by the Seminole Nation was going on. Uh, now, it should be noted that many historians debate whether or not these should be considered two separate wars or the same war, uh, but either way, the slave uprising um, 
greatly helped the Seminole war cause. So, uh, in response to Dave's massacre, uh, the Seminole uprising, and the uh, slave uprising, the U.S. government sent in uh, General Gaines and General Clinch, who were able to defeat the Seminole uh, in various engagements, including the Battle of with Kaluchi, um, sorry, with Kaluchi, uh, but uh, not without setbacks, uh, which included General Gaines uh, being injured, uh, which promptly forced the U.S. Army to withdraw from Florida, uh, who then, in response to the setback, uh, sent in the best general at the time, or at least one of the best general at the time, um, uh, General Winfield Scott, uh, who would eventually uh, become the general who instigated the uh, Cherokee removal and the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Uh, and he won a great many of victories, including the burning of the town, um, uh, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce uh, so as I don't uh, <laughs> uh, be disrespectful, but you can see uh, the name of the town right here. Uh, but he burnt down a great many uh, of Seminole towns and Seminole strongholds. Uh, but he was not actually able to bring an end to the Seminole war effort. He was not able to actually get um, that many large battles and uh, defeat that many uh Seminole war bands, uh, even with burning a lot of Seminole villages, because I mean they could just as easily flee into the swamps and hide and use guerrilla warfare uh, and things such as that. <clears throat> so uh, with that um, victory, but also setback, uh, General Ga sorry Governor Gaines himself, uh, Governor Call himself, the Governor Call himself marched into Florida. Uh, the Florida Territory um, with an army and was able to defeat the Seminole uh, in much similar way to uh, Winfield Scott in multiple uh, engagements, including the Battle of Wahoo Creek, uh, using, of course, boats um, and such to navigate through the Everglades. Now, this image is going to come up again because this is a, uh, the use of boats and naval power in the Seminole War will become important further on in the war. Um, but uh, either way, uh, Governor Call uh, was able to uh, gain yet another victory, but again, much in a similar way to Winfield Scott was unable to permanently um, or concisely put down the Seminole uh, war effort. Uh, and it's also around this time uh, that a, another war uh, between the U.S. and an American Indian nation was going on, the Creek War of 1836, also known as the Second Creek War, which was started uh, in response to Indian removal by the Lower Creek towns, uh, which promptly uh, led a, a um, uprising, sorry, again on the uprising, led uh, a organized attack on uh, U.S. settlements. Uh, in response, the U.S. Uh, and the Upper Creek towns, uh, led by Apothle Yohola, uh, marched and put down the Creek uh, uprising in the lower towns, uh, sorry, the Creek war effort in the lower towns, <clears throat> and um, forced them into Florida, uh, which actually backfired because all the Creek warriors who fled to Florida uh, offered their allegiance and their uh, help to the Seminole War effort, so therefore giving much needed reinforcements to Osceola and the Campy and St. Jones and others. Uh, before I continue, I should note in my very first video uh, on Indian removal, I accidentally uh, stated that Apothe Yohola was the one responsible for the starting of the Creek War of 1836. Uh, this was an accident due to a conflation with his earlier stances on being anti-removal, in which he was one of the individuals who was ordered by uh, Creek chiefs to kill uh, the Creek chief McIntosh for attempting to sell Creek land to the U.S. Um, but unfortunately for me, uh, by this time, he had already changed his mind and had become pro-Indian removal and was the one responsible for putting down the rebellion. So I apologize, uh, and I will work uh, in the future to make less mistakes such as that. 
But uh, another important thing about the Creek War of 1836, uh, uh, other than the reinforcements uh, who fled from uh, the Creek War of 1836 and helped continue the Seminole War, uh, a new general was free to um, now was now free to march into Florida, General Jessup, who during that time had been focused on helping put down the Creek uh, during the Creek War of 1836. And one of the things he did is he decided to. Uh, rather than focusing only on infantry, he decided to combine multiple military branches, including the Navy, uh, the Army, and a new military branch known as uh, the Division of Revenue Cutter Service, which I guarantee you, if nobody watching this video, um, I can't say that, I guarantee you most people watching this video uh, will not uh, recognize. Um, but uh, it is actually the predecessor to the Coast Guard, and in fact, eventually evolved into the Coast Guard. So uh, this uh, combination of three different military branches allowed Jessup to use a mixed military force and become uh, much more effective in the Florida swamps. <clears throat> uh, and with that effectiveness, he was able to eventually convince many Seminole chiefs as well as black Seminole leaders uh, and free uh, African leaders to uh, come for a truce. They agreed on a truce, and many of them agreed to uh, move west uh, to Indian Territory because they had since become weary of uh, the war effort. I mean, it had been going on for a couple of years now, by the time it was 1837, um, you know, the war started in 1835, and there have been, for the most part, nonstop fighting uh, uh, from then. Like you see in this map here, uh, Gain was able to uh, win some victories uh, in 1836 as well. Uh, and of these leaders who agreed to move out west, uh, were individuals such as John Horse, who appears to have changed his mind uh, on the war effort due to the death of his wife um, in uh, a, a battle against the U.S. Uh, now, once these individuals got to Florida, specifically the uh, Black Seminoles, they would uh, face further hardships. Um, but I will cover that uh, later uh, in the video. <clears throat> uh, so with the coming of this truce in 1837, uh, many Seminole chiefs, much uh, including Osceola and McCampy, were not, um, again, much like the Treaty of Payne's Landing, pleased to see this treaty or truce being signed. So this individual on the left, the unbeatable Sam Jones, a Seminole chief who never surrendered, uh, snuck into many of these camps that the uh, black Seminoles, the uh, free African Americans, and the um, Seminoles had surrendered and was able to convince between 700 to 800 of them to uh, un basically unsurrender, flee back into the swamps, and help continue the war effort. Also around this time, uh, the Cherokee, uh, led by John Ross, sent a delegation uh, into Florida to try and negotiate with the Seminole to get them to surrender and move out west. This happened because the U.S. government um, told that John, uh, John Ross that if he did this, that they would not uh, either not remove the Cherokee uh, from their homeland, or they would at least give them much more um, lenient concessions and later uh, negotiations. Uh, and of course, John Ross failed in these negotiations with Seminole, um, and the U.S. government never, um, the uh, U.S. government, of course, was never going to uh, do their end of the bargain, and they didn't. They never fulfilled their end of the bargain, uh, which is unsurprising. And then the final thing that was going on in 1837 that hampered the U.S.'s war efforts uh, heavily was an event known as the Crisis of 1837, in which a 
depression or recession um, and the uh, economic crisis was going on at the time. Uh, and it was uh, essentially, it's, it's one of the depressions or recessions that comes around in the US and other nations every 30 or so years. Um, and it was uh, fairly devastating to the US economy and was act, in fact blamed on President Andrew Jackson himself. So it's because of this and Sam Jones hampering uh, the surrender of uh, the Seminole, black Seminole and um, free African Americans that uh, stopped, sorry, it, it hindered the US's ability to uh, be, have a more focused and concerted uh, war effort against the Seminole. Uh, and then the final uh, events happening in 1837 and 1838 is Jessup um, offered uh, a false truce. It was, obviously they didn't know it was false at the time, but they offered a false truce to uh, Osceola and uh, McCampy if they would come and negotiate to it, it, at the fort with General Jessup, uh, which they did um, and were promptly captured and imprisoned. Um, with Osceola unfortunately dying uh, in captivity, uh, but not before a U.S. senator named McKinney came and painted uh, this portrait you see behind me, which is the same portrait in, uh, on the slide with uh, McCampy uh, of Osceola, uh, because McKinney was going around to various tribes, including the Cherokee and the Sioux, uh, etc., uh, and asking uh, prominent chiefs to allow him to paint portraits of them to preserve their memory, sorry, to preserve their memory, because they were going to go extinct and they were dying out, uh, which of course, as you know, is a very racist rhetoric, but that's the rhetoric of the time, um, and uh, unfortunately, he's the reason we have to thank uh, for this portrait, uh, one of the few portraits of Osceola himself. Uh, and with this capture, this was the end of Osceola's and McCampy's tenure in the Seminole War. Uh, so after uh, Sam Jones reunited the war and after the capture of uh, Osceola and McCampy, yet another uh, new general was sent in uh, to put down the uh, Seminole War, the Seminole War, and that was uh, the very famous Zachary Taylor, the general responsible for the victory at uh, Tippecanoe and an individual who would eventually become president himself. Uh, and he marched into Florida uh, and battled the Seminole in various engagements, uh, including uh, first the Battle of Lake Okeechobee, which he claimed was a victory. But when you look at the casualty rate, where he, where he lost uh, around 120 uh, dead and uh, not counting the wounded, um, whereas the Seminole lost about 20 dead, um, if that. Uh, and he states he won because the Seminole began to fall back, but if you consider that the Seminole were uh, generally using guerrilla warfare tactics during the war, um, combined with their very minimal casualties, uh, this doesn't seem like he was victory. In fact, m many historians consider this a Seminole tactical victory. Uh, the only way it's a U.S. victory is it's a victory of ego, uh, especially considering that after those battles, Zachary Taylor uh, began to fall back. <laughs> so uh, another battle that Zachary Taylor's forces lost was the Battle of Loxahatchee River, uh, in which a regiments led by um, Colonel Powell uh, battled the Seminole and were uh, heavily defeated at this river. <laughs> so this was a campaign was essentially a disaster. Um, they were not able to defeat uh, Seminoles, let alone the fact that, like you see in this map right here, uh, the U.S. military uh, outnumbered the Seminoles in each of the engagements uh, and still lost. So as a result of this yet another setback, the individual on the left, General Macomb, uh, Macomb uh, was sent 
into Florida to again attempt to negotiate with these Seminole uh, leaders. Um, and it looked like he was maybe getting some headway, and maybe the war might end. Uh, you know, this is in 1839. Uh, but as the sign on the right says, uh, a fort was attacked by uh, 160 Seminoles uh, who killed 14 soldiers. Um, with a few soldiers, such as Colonel William Harney, uh, the commander of the fort, being able to escape downriver. Uh, so, with that, the war was reignited. So, uh, with the reignition of the war, the West began to um, change up their tactics a little. Uh, one of the ways they did that was they began to utilize bloodhounds in order to sniff out, uh, literally, the um, uh, war, the enclaves of war bands and Seminole villages hidden within the swamps, um, which they used to great effect. Another way uh, was a, a tactic uh, employed by General Armistead in which uh, things known as the Mosquito Fleets uh, broke off uh, from various uh, bases, uh, U.S. bases on Florida islands, uh, and began to heavily search um, and invade the Florida swamps. This is where that picture from the Battle of Wahoo Swamp comes in again, because you see uh, the utilization of boats in this, because obviously the Navy um, would have much more success uh, using going through the Florida swamps because there are in many places in the Florida Everglades and Florida swamps where it is impossible to walk um, and can only be traversed by boat. So why wouldn't you use Navy capabilities to um, fight the Seminole? Um, and it's all, and then it is also uh, in this reignition uh, and reinvigoration of the U.S. war effort that Colonel Harney was able to get revenge for his uh, regiment's massacre. Uh, with Colonel Harney being the individual on the left, uh, and defeat many Seminole enclaves, uh, uh, resulting in really only, literally only one uh, casualty for. Um, Harney himself. Uh, among the victims of this was uh, Sam Jones's wife. So in response, Sam Jones uh, sent in one of his uh, leaders and interpreters, uh, Ten Tiger Tails, to negotiate. Uh, but of course the negotiations, much like previous times, didn't really get anywhere. Uh, so as a result of that, uh, yet another general was placed in charge. Uh, of the war effort, uh, the figure on the far left, General Worth, um, as well as another, the general on the far right, General McCall. Uh, furthermore, uh, younger individuals who would eventually become important in both the uh, uh, U.S. Army and eventual Confederate Army were also sent into Florida, um, including one in the middle, whom we recognize as William Tecumseh Sherman, who at the time was only a major. And it was at this time that the war was sort of beginning to wind down. Um, the Seminole in the U.S. were scoring victories against each other left and right, really not gaining any ground on each other at all. So as a result of this um, heavy infighting slog match, uh, eventually uh, the Armed Occupation Act was passed in 1842, uh, which um, basically filled Florida with... Uh, militia and U.S. soldiers, uh, but allowed the Seminoles to be left alone so long as they stayed in this small uh, section of Florida. Um, eventually, this uh, conflict would be reignited uh, again in the 1850s and what would be known as the Third Seminole War, but I'll cover that in a later video about the Civil War because it's concurrent with it. Uh, but either way, this uh, conflict that had been going on for seven years sort of ended in a kind of draw uh, between the U.S. and the Seminoles. Um, but you could also consider it a Seminole victory because they were allowed to stay uh, in their land, albeit, unfortunately, in 
even sm an even smaller uh, region of Florida than they had um, controlled before the Treaty of Payne Flanding. <clears throat> but this was not the end for uh, uh, the Black Seminoles, uh, because when John Horse and the Black Seminoles uh, left the war effort uh, and went to Indian Territory, uh, to the Seminole Nation of uh, Oklahoma, uh, they unfortunately began to see uh, more hardship um, in the form of uh, attempts at re-enslavement from the other four of the five civilized tribes because they still had uh, chattel slavery. Uh, the biggest uh, instigator um, of this was the Creek Nation, who often sent slave catchers into Seminole territory to uh, capture these uh, black Seminoles and free uh, African Americans. So as a result of this, uh, Sam Jones and the black Seminoles and free African Americans uh, fled to Mexico uh, and created a yet another unique culture called the Muscogees, uh, the Muscogos, the, the Muscogos. Uh, who lived in Mexico uh, for many years until the 1860s, in which uh, the U.S., uh, sorry, 1870s, in which the U.S. invited them back into uh, Texas, where the Muscogos um, became very uh, sought-after scouts uh, for uh, uh, the U.S. military, and, they, and, of course, even a little bit the uh, Confederate military, uh, but mainly the U.S. military. Um, a further legacy of these Black Seminoles uh, is the existence of uh, several state parks honoring their history, uh, such as Fort Mose State Park, uh, which is the site of the oldest free Black community in the U.S. period, um, which is great that this site exists and honors uh, their history. Another uh, site honoring their history uh, is in the Bill Baggs Cape Cod, uh, Florida uh, State Park, um, in which there is a plaque uh, honoring uh, runaway uh, enslaved Africans who were able to escape to freedom uh, to the Bahamas. And then, of course, we have very important individuals uh, in uh, Black Seminole history. Um, such as Pompey Factor uh, and Isaac Paines, uh, these two individuals here, Pompey Factor, Isaac Paines, who were uh, very skilled scouts for the U.S. military in the 1880s, uh, in fact so skilled that they both received the Medal of Honor. And then uh, on the right you have an, this individual, uh, Eugene Bullard, who was the first Black American fighter pilot. Um, but not for the U.S., uh, for France, because he resigned his commission to the U.S. military and went to France and joined uh, the French Air Force uh, and became one of their best pilots, um, therefore earning his place in history. Um, and so it's important to, that these people uh, are remembered. Obviously, these are not the only individuals, but they're some of the uh, most notable individuals. So, uh, Black Seminole history as well as Seminole history still influences the U.S. Uh, to this day. So, did you learn any of that in uh, history class? Um, I know I didn't uh, during my K-12 through school. It wasn't until college that I learned about this. Um, so, uh, I hope you enjoyed learning of, about this uh, event uh, that was probably new to you, uh, and if it wasn't, I hope you enjoyed um, my description of it, uh, and uh, stay tuned uh, uh, later on for my uh, third and final video for Black History Month uh, about the most decorated U.S. Uh, marshal in uh, the Old West uh, from the 1860s to the early 1900s, uh, Bass Reeves, who he himself was in fact uh, the uh, inspiration for uh, the Lone Ranger. Uh, of course, the Lone Ranger was white, whereas Bass Reeves was black, but I'll cover that uh, in the video about Bass Reeves.
Um, with that, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I hope you have a good day.